Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges. Welcome to On Contact. Today we're going to talk about the importance of protesting during the upcoming conventions with organizers Sherry Honkala and Galen Tyler. Uh, the situation that people are facing in this country is absolutely devastating. Uh, they're not surviving the Republicans and they're not surviving the Democrats. So um, we're, we're seeing that our march, the March for Our Lives, is actually turning into uh, a symbol of political independence in our country. On con deal, liberalism, patriotism. Truth is not a social class war, corporate crudeta, utopian ideology of neoliberalism, revolt en masse. On con, on con, on con, Chris Hedges. We will recapture our democracy in the streets of cities such as Cleveland or Philadelphia, not in convention halls such as the aptly named Wells Fargo Center, where the Democratic Party elites intend to celebrate the results of the rigged primary elections and the continuity of corporate power. For this reason, Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein, other activists, and I will march in a protest organized by the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign on July 25th at 3 p.m from City Hall in Philadelphia. It is not as if we have a choice. No one invited us into the center or to the lavish corporate sponsored receptions. No one anointed us to be Clinton's superdelegates, a privilege that went to corporate lobbyists, rich people, and party hacks. We have the best democracy money can buy. The Wells Fargo Center and the fancy hotels in Philadelphia will be swarming with corporate representatives and lobbyists from Comcast, Xerox, Google, and dozens of other corporations that manage our political theater. This is where their party will be held. Ours will be outside the gates the elites have erected to keep us out. Anya Parampil looks at the security preparations that are being put in place in Cleveland and Philadelphia for the conventions. The race for the White House will be finalized in the coming weeks as both the Republicans and the Democratic Party prepare for their conventions to be held in Cleveland and Philadelphia, respectively. The party's candidates, their running mates, and their platforms will be hammered out at these highly securitized meetings. And with 50,000 people estimated to be descending on the cities for the conventions, the security budgets are ballooning. Fifty million dollars. That's how much money the federal government has granted Cleveland to prepare security for the RNC, which will take place at Quicken Loans Arena. And while much of the specifics have been kept under wraps and will be until the end of the convention, we have a small picture of what that money will be spent on. Earlier this year, a spending panel approved about $577 million in purchases, including 300 bicycles and 310 helmets, 500 interlocking steel barriers, and 2,400 camelback water packs. In March, the city sought bids from companies looking to buy 2,000 so-called elite defender riot control suits, as well as 26-inch batons. It's estimated around a third of Cleveland's 1,700-strong police force will be on duty, along with up to 3,500 out-of-city, state, and federal forces. Philadelphia, on the other hand, was given $43 million from the federal government to prepare for the DNC though they seem to be anticipating less mayhem. In June, the city opted not to buy an armored vehicle, as well as other riot gear, as originally planned. Instead, most of the city's budget will be spent on overtime costs, plume modeling technology, supplies such as traffic cones and motorcycle helmets, and various contracts. Mayor Jim Kenney says he believes bicycle cops are the most effective way to deal with protests. While it's clear both parties are anticipating massive attendance, the tone set by the policing approach in each city suggests they're expecting very different crowds. Thank you, Anya. Galen Tyler and Sherry Honkala are Philadelphia-based activists. Galen runs the Kensington Welfare Rights Union that advocates for the poor and homeless. Sherry is the national coordinator of the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. In 2012, she was the Green Party's nominee for vice president. Galen and Sherry will lead a protest march at the upcoming Democratic National Convention. Sherry, Galen, thanks for joining me. Let's talk about why. Why 
uh, are you in taking to the streets in Philadelphia, encouraging and align yourself with groups that are taking to the streets in uh, Cleveland for both of these two conventions? I've been in the anti-poverty movement for over 30 years now. Uh, the situation that people are facing in this country is absolutely devastating. Uh, they're not surviving the Republicans and they're not surviving the Democrats. So um, we're, we're seeing that our march, the March for Our Lives, is actually turning into uh, a symbol of political independence in our country. And so we want everybody to come and march with us, uh, homeless veterans. Um, you know, kids that feel like they don't have any kind of future. Our city has the, the number one drug overdose uh, rate in the country. And uh, we have, you know, 300 people, you know, within walking distance of my house that have no place uh, to live. And, uh, uh, you know, things are just devastating. Across the street from my house, five people were shot, three of them were teenagers. This is Kensington, the, an area in North Philadelphia, which I think is, is the poorest district in the state of Pennsylvania, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, it's the historical area where Mother Jones, when she was arrived, marched here to New York City and, you know, tried to raise what was happening to children, uh, having their limbs cut off, and if she was alive today, she'd have no place uh, to march from because there are no factories, and those factories are not coming back. Let me ask Galen. Um, we've seen a situation in these poor pockets of Philadelphia where things have deteriorated. I mean, I was talking to Sherry before, and she said, you know, back in 2000 when you were involved in a march uh, against the Republican National Convention he held in Philadelphia, people were working two to three jobs to survive. Now, now it's just kind of permanent unemployment. Yes, the things is, you know, we have seen, you know, in the last 16 years how things have increased you know, I mean, the amount of poverty and devastation that we see in foreign relationship, the people that are coming into our office telling us their horror stories. It's like really 10 times worse, you know, um, than we've seen 16 years ago. And before living, you know, in a Democratic town, you know, going against the Republican when the Republican National Convention was there, um, a lot of people, you know, thought that, you know, they come out and support in relation to the Republicans. but. The last 16 years, you know what I mean, and, you know, another eight years of Obama that, that went through, that went past, um, people haven't seen no difference, whether between the Republicans or the Democrats. And so, as Sherry was saying earlier, people are trying to see how can they break the chains and become free from the Democrats and the Republicans. What is it that you want to do with this march? And maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, Cleveland as well, because I know you're involved in also protests in Cleveland, Sherry. Yeah, well, uh, we think that this march, the March for Our Lives, offers an opportunity for uh, disgruntled folks that, you know, worked all year long on the Bernie campaign uh, and now are being, you know, sold this uh, hill of beans that uh, they well, should we, just... We should, I suppose, <laughs> stop there and say that one of the events that you have planned is a Beans for Hillary event. Do you want to tell us what that is? Yeah, um, because we think this whole thing stinks. Um, the delegates that are inside the convention and outside of the convention, we're going to have a big bean fest in Kensington on American Street where there's the permanently unemployed. Um, you know, we know that you'll be there, and we've invited Dr. Jill Stein, we've invited Bernie and Bernie delegates. Uh, and after the Bean Fest, uh, we will have a fart in. At the Democratic Convention. Yes. We An idea to... taken from Saul Alinsky. That's correct. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, what we hope to accomplish is um, not so much hope to accomplish, we know what's going to happen. Um, that uh, uh, with 1,800 reporters that are coming into town, we have a moral responsibility to talk about the truth, uh, to talk about people going without food. Uh, entire uh, communities of unemployed men that are n not just trying to struggle on two less than $2 a day, they're, they're going like a couple weeks without $2. Uh, you know, Galen and I were just doing a food distribution the other day in the neighborhood, and you know we had these like old 
terrible salad that looks kind of scary to eat. And they were the, the unemployed single individuals were just like almost fighting each other to, to have some salad to eat. That's how bad the situation is. Uh, you know, and yet, Kaylin, this huge, I mean, half the country now lives in a state of poverty. Um, in areas such as Kensington, people are living in, you know, what the government calls deep poverty, but extreme poverty, and yet they're completely invisible to the wider society. Yeah, I think that's because, you know, it's, it's a situation where people are, are managing people's perception. When you look at the mainstream media and what they put out there on a daily basis, doesn't show the real reality of what's going on in the communities and neighborhoods. When you think of Philadelphia, most people think of the Liberty Bell, people think of the Constitution Center, they think of Independence Hall, they think of the Rocky and the statue. And these are all the things that people constantly promote people to come visit Philadelphia. But they don't talk about the people, get at me, that's like less than 10, you know what I mean, blocks away, you know what I mean, that don't have a job, that don't have a way of feeding or providing for themselves and their family. So, um, you know, as people, you know, wonder why this isn't out there and why people aren't talking about it, why we aren't, it, it isn't a change hasn't happened already because it's been going on for so long, it's because people have been hiding it. And we think this march for our lives, you know what I mean, it's inclusive of everyone's lives. You know, when we talk about March for Our Lives, we're not talking about one particular section of the population. We're talking about what's going to save this planet, what's going to save each and every person, you know what I mean, to have a chance to not just barely survive, but be able to thrive, you know, in this country. And and you have the same kind of poverty in Cleveland as you do in Philly. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, the two cities are, you know, mirrors of each other um, that um, there's you know, huge numbers of permanently unemployed, there's gentrification. Um, well, you have this kind of downtown Potemkin, both in Philly and Cleveland, although you don't have to go very far outside of this disnified yes. city center to see tremendous poverty. Yeah, uh, definitely. And there's also this uh, illusion um, of scarcity. Uh, when it's really a question of distribution and it's really a question of greed and uh, you know we're gonna spend 60 million in Philadelphia uh, the same numbers uh, this is for like security and no 60 well. million is for their parties and 43 million is for uh, security so uh, it's big numbers, big numbers to hide the reality and the truth of what's going to happen in Philadelphia. But this time, they're not going to be able to cap the rage. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's take a short break. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Sherry Honkala and Galen Tyler. <laughs> Decades, the American middle class has been railroaded by Washington politics. Big money corporate interest has drowned out a lot of voices. That's how it is in the news culture in this country now. That's where I come in. I'm Ed Schultz. I do the news on RT America. I'll make sure you don't get railroaded and you'll get the straight talk and the straight news. Question more. What politicians do is something we don't do. They put themselves on the line, and they get accepted or rejected. So when you want to be president, what would you want to be? What would someone want to be president? What's it like to be president? What's it like when the phone rings at 3 in the morning? Can't be a good call. I'm interested always in the whys and the hows. And keep Larry. Question more. About your sudden passing, I've only just learned. You wore yourself thin, taking your last wrong turn. Your act got up to you as we all knew it would. I'd tell you I'm sorry, if only I could. So I write these last words in hopes to put to rest these things that I never got off my chest. I remember when we first met, my life turned on each breath. 
but then my feelings started to change. You talked about war like it was a game. Still, some were fond of you, those that didn't like to question or argue. And I secretly promised to never be like you. It's said one does not leave a funeral the same as one enters. The mind gets consumed with death, but this one quite differs. I speak to you now because there were no other takers. To proclaim that mainstream media has met its maker. Here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. Really? The only show I go out of my way to watch every week. Exclusive. It really packs a punch. Ow! Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. You guys do have the same accent. Hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the World Bank, though, hates it. Seriously, he sent us an email. Welcome back. I'm joined today by Philadelphia-based activists Sherry Honkala and Galen Tyler. So Sherry, I mean, I think your analysis from what I've heard you say in the past from your involvement in the Green Party is that we're just not going to bring about significant change unless we step outside of the system and defy it. Absolutely. Um, if uh, we don't see uh, a new political party formed in this country um, or lifted up like the Green Party and uh, Dr. Jill Stein become our next president, um, then we're going to have to organize uh, the new American Spring. We don't have any other choices. Um, we are not, uh, we can't afford another two, four, six years. I mean, our, our planet is going to disappear. We're going to go to war. And those of us um, that are trying to raise kids, we don't know if they're going to be shot at any given moment and die. Um, and well, that's the reality. you talk about the anxiety you feel when your son goes to school. Yeah, absolutely. I have an autistic 13-year-old um, who has to somehow navigate going to school uh, when across the street they shot uh, five people and three of them were teenagers. And that's just the reality. And, uh, and even if he has a school to go to, they've been closing schools left and right in cities like Philly. They've closed over 40 schools, and we're going to be leading reality tours uh, during the Democratic National Convention. So if people want to see the other side of Philadelphia, uh, especially reporters, people from the faith community, you name it, we're going to show folks what it looks like. Galen, within you know the African American community in Philadelphia, how would you describe the political mood? I mean, numerically, African Americans are supposed to vote. I think 80 percent for Hillary Clinton. Yeah, and and I think people are starting to get you know um, after Obama, you know, I mean, being the first African American president and people being excited about voting. I think um, in the African American community, that voting, you know, I mean, um, wanting to be able to like really go out and cast your vote is no longer there. They still are not being able to provide for themselves and their family. They still are seeing, you know, um, like Sherry was saying, the school closing, kids not being able to get, like, basic education. So if you're living in a community in a neighborhood where you're not being able to get, like, the basic education to be able to read and write, there's no jobs, you know what I mean? And they're cutting the welfare programs and stuff on a regular basis. So you know people are going to commit crimes. And so we're trying to prevent that. I myself have joined the Green Party, you know, probably about, like, six, seven years ago. And I've been, um, I'm currently um, the chair of the Green Party of Philadelphia. And one thing things I want to do and ensure that, you know, the Green Party looks like America. And by being an African-American male, I want to be able to tell people there is an alternative to just voting for the Democrats. Um, just 
by being born and you're thinking of oh, African American male, I should vote Democrats without looking in the background and seeing, you know, what I mean, the issues. Does that candidate really represent me and well, my family? Well, of course, and so many African Americans are disenfranchised because of felony charges anyway. Absolutely. And we think that, you know, um, the only way to really change that is to start bringing, you know, new ideas of like, you don't have to be Democrat or Republican. It should be three, four, five, six different other parties that's out there to give you a chance to choose from so that you're not just locked in to um, Pepsi or Coke, um, as people always say. What happens, Sherry, if this assault, this corporate assault of neoliberalism and austerity coupled with the security and surveillance state is not broken and continues to extract more and more from the poor. What are we going to see? Well, we'll see what's already happening. Um, there's, I, re I remember the scene in the movie Schindler's List where all the mothers are like lethargic, they're like half dead and they're walking around at the concentration camp until they turn and they see their children being taken away in the back of a truck. And that's actually what we see happening across this country is um, like in Philadelphia, um, w the um, Department of Human Services and Child Protection, uh, the use of the state uh, to threaten poor mothers by taking their kids because they don't have running water, they don't have food in their house. And yet, isn't this system broken? Wasn't it just uh, declared, uh, you know, the, the Child Protection Services and the in the city of Philadelphia declared inadequate? Am I yeah, that right? Yeah, declared inadequate. And the reason they did that is because they're going to privatize the social oh. welfare program, the, de the department that deals with children. Um, so how frightening is that? Uh, we can serve as a model for the rest of the country to privatize just about everything. Um, and that absolutely terrifies me. I mean, I grew up um, in and out of foster care and was taken from my mom. Because you were, we, and you were homeless for a and, while. And was homeless, homeless. And that was all because my mom didn't have access to decent, affordable housing. Uh, and they didn't have better women's shelters back then. Well, basically, um, the condition is 10 times worse than when I was growing up. They have better women's shelters. Um, but though the better women's shelters have been full to capacity for years now and victims of domestic violence are lining our shelters throughout the country and putting everybody else in dangerous situations as well. Um, so I'm not, I'm not worried uh, because I know people love their children. We're beginning to get organized. Uh, we see this as, you know, uh, soldiers in an army for peace and uh, a new society and transformation of our country. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, we're going to organize the American Spring. And uh, What's that going to look like? What that's going to look like is people getting serious about getting organized on every single block throughout the entire country. It means that we're going to have to go back to uh, creating independent media in a real way. I mean, most of Philadelphia, even its independent media, is on the Democratic Party payroll right now. So that's why we think shows like this are incredibly important uh, um, because reporters are going in and are, again, being sold this hill of beans. Right. Um, and uh, uh, even through the progressive media right now in Philadelphia, and that's really frightening to us because when you no longer have a, a media, um, when you no longer have people from the faith community standing up to injustice, when you have the entire uh, town uh, that's trying to create some other kind of, of, of um, uh, picture over on the side so that people don't see the reality of what's happening in Philadelphia, that's a very scary thing. And the Democrats are going to stop at nothing to make sure that we are not heard from, that we are not seen. Um, and uh, let, let me ask Galen about that because yeah. I had heard from Sherry that when you are going to meetings, um, you are a, organizing meetings, all sorts of people from Homeland Security are showing up. What do you call them, the floor walkers or something? Talk a little bit about how that process. And I know Sherry has done uh, protests, I think, to WTO and others where they came and arrested you actually before the event. 
what are you seeing in terms of the security and surveillance apparatus? Well, I'm saying, you know, as we've been trying to be strategic in our tactics and stuff, they have been getting smarter and more strategic, you know, in their practices as well. Um, as we do go to meetings on a regular basis, you can understand, you know, I mean, what side people on, just based on the questions and the the, the, the tone and the. So you mean they're coming up and questioning you personally? Not just me personally. Out in the opening, the questions that they ask is to set the stage on. For instance, what, what are you like talking what? about? Um, like about around violence or something uh -huh. like that. When people mention violence in a sense of um, we've been nonviolence. You can look at our history. Right. You know, I mean, we 25 year history of doing march protests, and it's always been nonviolence. It's always been, you know, I mean, with women, children, people from the disabled community, people, faith community, um, teachers, doctors, lawyers, you name it, um, have always been a part of our march. And they come straight in, you know what I mean, trying to set the um, conversation around violence when we're talking about, like, issues and maybe talking about how we're going to be able to, you know what I mean, do this march and pull it off, you know what I mean, without any kind of glitches and then ensuring that everybody, you know, can be participating in this march and it be safe, you know, based on our security that we already have formed from a long history of experience. Do you get a sense they're trying to entrap you? Is that... I think they, they pretty much want to, like, deter people from actually marching with us. I think they want to try to drop our numbers. Um, by, the, by, by raising the specter that there would be the possibility of violence? Exactly. And once you raise this question, people that are already in bad situations, you know what I mean? The last right. thing they need is to be going to jail or trying to figure out how they're not going to be able to Let me ask, them. you're going to do a Clinton town? Yes, we're setting up a Clintonville. We're, we're setting up a Clintonville based, based on, on like, Hoovervilles, right? Of the it Great is, Depression, right? Yeah. We're unemployed, primarily veterans, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Set up, uh, you know, shanty towns, and so we're going to do that this time. Uh, why are we doing that? Because we don't really have any other choice. Um, we have lots of families. They don't have any place to go. They can't all fit into my house or into Galen's or other members. Um, so we're going to have to take some public space. Right now, in my neighborhood in Kensington, uh, they're putting up gates all over the place. Uh, my son made a joke the other day and said, Mom, we're finally living in a gated community. These are police barricades? Um, no, they're, they're like six-foot um, fences huh. uh, on, uh, around vacant land. So like every oh, I see. So you, block. So you can't use the land? Yes. yes. Oh, how clever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but talk about it. somebody's, somebody's making some money right. uh, yeah. with the fencing right now. So they're, they're fencing up as many um, uh, city blocks as they possibly can in Kensington. So yes, uh, people are welcome there. Um, you know, no drugs, no violence. And uh, this is for uh, families that have no other choice. And let's recap the march. July 25th, 3 o'clock, south side of City Hall. We're going to march to the oh, front doors. I will be there. And the beans for Hillary? Beans for Hillary. And they've Hillary. been mailing beans from all over the country yes, to you, I hear? Yes, people keep sending us those <laughs> beans. We okay. uh, To 1301 West Porter Street in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, we'll have a bean fest on the final day after the whatever the speech is. The on the 28th. Great. Two lots of beans. All right. Thanks, Galen. And thank you, Sherry. Uh, thank you very much for joining me with Galen Tyler and Sherry Honkala. The corporate state seeks to legitimize itself through elections it controls. It exploits laws that once protected democracy to extinguish democracy. It has ruled, for example, that unlimited corporate campaign contributions are part of our First Amendment right to free speech and our right to petition the government as citizens. The endless election cycles are not driven by substantive issues, but manufactured political personalities, opinion polls, cliches, and insults. There is no national institution in the United States that can be described as authentically democratic. The mechanisms that once allowed the citizen to be a participant in power, from elections to enjoying the rights of dissent and privacy, have been nullified. Money has replaced the vote. The state has obliterated privacy through mass surveillance and destroyed institutions such as labor unions that once protected workers from corporate abuse. This means two things. We continue to creep forward 
to a naked police state, or we take to the streets, as Sherry, Galen, and I will do in Philadelphia on July 25th, to wrest back our democracy. Thank you for watching. You can find us on rt.com slash uncontact. Until next week.